So years before I was doing a lot of this stuff, I actually ran a, had a basic science lab. I was a cell biologist. Um, and I liked working with cells because they didn't talk back to me. Um, <clears throat> But there's one thing I learned very early is that cells are all clones. If you've not done any cell work, you might not know this, but all cells in a culture dish are exactly the same. They're clones. They just split off from each other and divide, and they're identical. They're all identical. So whatever you do to the dish of cells, they all do it. Now, as a physician, whatever I do to people, they don't all do the same thing, right? Some of them don't listen to me. Some of them don't respond the way I want to. Some of them have adverse effects. Some don't. Some get better. Some get worse. So people are not cells, right? Um, but we were able to use some of this to try to understand the disease a little better. And so um, your brain makes a compound called dopamine. And this is the, the chemical that helps your body move. It's also the chemical that feeds your reward system, right? So when you do something correctly, your brain gives you a little shot of dopamine. You say, wow, that worked really well. I'm going to do that again. Okay? Um, it also is the part of the brain that fires off for like gambling. So when you play the slot machine and you win one time, right, your brain says, wow, that was great. I'm going to give you a shot of dopamine. And that reinforces the behavior. Right? Of course, casinos hope that because then you keep firing your quarters into the slot machine and you don't win again, right? But you keep doing it, and the reason you keep doing it is because you learned from one win that that dopamine release felt really good, okay? Does anybody run? Any runners in the audience? So when you're running and you hit that sort of wall, you know, hit that wall and you break through that wall and you get that really good feeling, right? Part of that's your dopamine system, okay? It's rewarding you for doing something that's good for you, okay? So your body has a way of breaking down all these chemicals. And so it's a very complex metabolism. Get, don't worry about all the little uh, bits and pieces, um, except that this little bugger right here, right here, is an intermediate step. So it only lasts for a few seconds. And that's a good thing, because it's really toxic. Right? It's an aldehyde, like from aldehyde. It's dopa aldehyde, but it's, aldehydes are very bad for cells. They don't like them. That's why there's three different ways the body has of getting rid of that quickly. Okay. So, but what we found is if we isolate that chemical and we put it on some protein, it makes the protein clump. But none of these other parts, chemicals, make the protein clump. So in a test tube, we can make a Lewy body just by adding protein and dopal, dopa aldehyde. We can also do it in cells. Remember, those clone cells. All we have to do is put a little bit of dopal on a cell, and it makes a Lewy body. Okay. So we're able to model this. And my lab at the time that we're doing this was one of the few labs in the world that could make Lewy bodies in a cell culture dish. Um, so then we took that, and we injected that into rats. Now, rats aren't people, although some people are rats. Um, <laughs> But, but rats aren't people, okay? Uh, but you can use an animal model to try to understand a disease, right? And so if you inject the rat with dopal, what we saw were a couple of interesting things. So one is that the dopamine cells in the rat brain would die. Those that died were in the area that of the dopamine cells, but not in other areas. So very selective injury. So the cells around that area that weren't dopamine cells didn't die. That in the rat brain, that injection would start to form clumps of protein that were like Lewy bodies. And that the rat developed Parkinsonism. So by injecting this, we're able to recapitulate the model of disease. Okay? Now, I don't do animal work anymore. I work with people. Um, but we were able to use this going prospectively. So if we understand what tracks in the brain are breaking down, could we study that in people? And we can. So we can use a fancy MRI technique. It's called diffusion kurtosis imaging. So it's a regular MRI. We just add a couple of extra sequences to it. And we can model all of the tracks in the brain. Okay? And we can follow those tracks all the way out and we can compare different diseases. 
so we can compare controlled individuals to people with Alzheimer's disease, to people with Parkinson's disease, to people with MS or any other disease that we want to. Okay. And we could look and see what parts of the brain change. So in Parkinson's disease, we see a change and a breakdown in this, the dopamine tracks. So going from the substantia nigra, the dopamine cells, up into the brain that control the motor programs. Okay? So in a living person, we can actually see the tract degeneration. Um, and we can study this to a great extent. So when we look at controls versus people with Parkinson's disease, versus people with Parkinson's dementia. From a control to a Parkinson person, we start to see a breakdown in large fiber tracts, right? Um, so the biggest fiber tracts are breaking down. Um, so how the left brain talks to the right brain, how the front of the brain talks to the back of the brain. Those are big, big, giant tracts, right? So the brain is like a, a series of electrical wires. So we're breaking down all the big wires. As we go from Parkinson's disease to Parkinson's disease with dementia, all the little wires start to break down. So all the little connections between different brain regions are breaking down. Okay? And these breakdowns correspond to those changes in visual spatial skills, executive skills, and memory skills. So what have we learned so far? Well, by using these multimodal approaches, right, MRI and PET scans and EEGs, and I've showed you some of that data here, we're really under able to understand a lot of these underlying mechanisms. Because if you understand a mechanism, then you can develop a, a drug or a treatment for that mechanism. If you don't know the mechanism, it's really hard to develop a therapy. Um, so we illustrated a schematic of how a faulty switch, right, can lead you from going alert to um, staring. Um, we also showed of uh, these faulty switch may lead to other things because if you have a breakdown in your error checking system and your brain can't check for errors, then you're much more likely to have errors that could potentially be problematic, like leading you to fall. Um, the point of this is that we've now developed some possible endpoints for clinical trial design, right? So I don't develop drugs. That's not, that's not what my lab, I, I test drugs once they're given to me, but I don't develop drugs. But what I've developed here are the endpoints for how we could test whether a drug works in a way that's much more specific to the disease than using tests for Alzheimer's disease. Okay. And these models have a great potential to be expanded to look at other diseases. So we can apply this to epilepsy, to multiple sclerosis, doesn't matter, right? Because the brain is the brain, and we can use these models then to test these things going forward. So last couple of minutes, um, how, do we, how are we going to do this to improve the diagnosis? So I showed you lots and lots of data. So one of the things I do as part of my research is develop clinical tools. In other words, how can I help the average practicing clinician improve his ability to make a diagnosis? As I told you from the experience of families of Lewy body patients, 18 months, six physicians, 12 visits just to get a diagnosis. So I showed this slide before. Remember I said we used our autopsy sample, people we followed in life, and then we saw what was, was in death. So we can see which symptoms seem to predict whether Lewy bodies were present. So we use these to create a scale. Uh, it's not advancing anymore? Okay. So what we developed is a composite risk score. So 10 questions, yes, no, are these, any of these 10 symptoms present? Very easy to use. If you look at people who are controls versus people with Alzheimer's disease versus people with Lewy body dementia, the Lewy body dementia averaged about six. The Alzheimer's and the controls averaged about one. Okay, so those 10 scales, those 10 questions, allowed us to correctly classify individuals 97% of the time. That's a pretty good test. Mm 